Welcome to episode, uh, I believe this is actually 30, 35, 36 actually. This is episode 36 of the series about security podcast for April 24th, 2013. Uh, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined by Keith Watson and Mike Hill via video, and uh, Josh Gillum via a chat window. Um, and uh, I have the first article today, so I will start off with that. Um, the first article is about uh, a flawed security update uh, by uh, Malwarebytes. Um, basically, they released a security update that detected uh, Windows DLL and executable files as malware and stop them from running, which caused uh, various uh, IT systems and PCs to stop working. Obviously, if your operating system files are detected as malware and stop working, then your entire operating system stops working. So um, malware bytes uh, acknowledged that their their updates were wrong. They acknowledged that their update policy was flawed and and agreed to that they would look into it and hopefully make this not happen in the future. But I thought this article was interesting because um, they mentioned that uh, thousands of servers were knocked off of the internet and the operating systems obviously went down because of this this uh, security update to malware bytes and and I wanted to ask the question of do you think malware bytes and then <laughs> do you think malware bytes and virus scanners in general on servers are are relevant in this day and age um, honestly um, I find them uh, something that is good to run probably on a workstation where users are constantly browsing the internet, downloading files, you know, viewing ads with potential malware in it and things like that. But on a server, you don't have that thing, that, that issue where users are not used, accessing web pages and things like that. So do you think that uh, virus scanning and malware uh, detection utilities such as malware bytes is relevant in this day and age? I'm having terrible trouble with lots of technology issues today. So anyways, <laughs> I was going to say that... Um, uh, the issue here is not necessarily what a user is going to bring to the system, although that is frequently the problem in terms of email or what they're browsing to, but also uh, worms that propagate through the network as well. So to completely cut them out and say, oh, yeah, it's a server, you don't need it, there are some risks still that are not associated with users uh, causing the issue too. Well, one of the things I see as um, as the issue here is the uh, the update policy. Um, I, I think I read in the article something like um, eighty percent of one company's servers were knocked offline, and it just seems uh, in, in a large organization or even a smaller one for that matter that you would kind of have your um, baseline machine where you would test updates. You know, just initially and see if it has any negative effects before rolling it out. So I was a bit surprised to see that um, so many would just have kind of the auto update. You know, it, it's sort of saying we trust these updates to not do anything malicious. And I'm not sure that's a good stance because uh, whether accidentally and intentionally um, problems can get put into the updates and then if you're auto updating you apply them to all your machines at once and, and that's that's not good and can result in what happened here well another question is um, malware bytes is by far the only company that has had this problem I mean we've seen this with McAfee uh, trend micro uh, maybe a, a trend micro security expert uh, told the that, that because you need to combat new and fast-moving threats, 
that f that makes uh, faulty updates a constant danger because they have to con continuously update your uh, definitions um, because of the the speed at which new uh, new malware and new viruses are created these days, and so it makes it difficult to completely test everything um, because in in testing it you slow down the um, amount of time it takes for users to get these updates and, and in that time they could have gotten infected so it's kind of one of those issues where um, does the does testing create more risk than not testing yeah and let me clarify um, you make a good point that was actually a point I was going to get to um, I do think um, it was unfortunate malware bytes released uh, the flawed update but I think there's a good reason maybe why they did because they need to get the updates out as quickly as possible uh, but what I was refer referring to was the companies themselves how quickly they apply the updates to their servers that's where I would I guess apply some criticism because regardless of who the vendor is I think you need to do some in-house testing first you know have a baseline machine test it see if it does anything bad and then roll it out to other servers kind of in a defined fashion so that you can mitigate the risk to your servers uh, from those updates uh, because as you mentioned earlier Preston you know it's it's questionable whether in some cases whether you even need uh, anti-malware antivirus software on it um, so considering that in, in, in servers in particular I'm not necessarily speaking to the users workstations but servers in particular I think you should have a very well-defined process that says I'm gonna apply these updates I now have a 80 percent confidence in, in this update and I believe it won't do anything bad but to just let the servers auto update um, I think might be could be bad and could lead to things like this well I I, I mean in, in, in risk analysis um, when you when you Id attempt to identify risks, um, one of the one of the factors you go on is has this ever happened before? And in my experience, um, I've never had a virus or a piece of malware uh, ever get detected on one of my servers. I, I mean, I've had it get on workstations, malware, viruses, things like that. But in my career, I've never seen a virus or a piece of malware get onto a server. Uh, before, so that's why I'm asking the question because, <clears throat> um, to me, the risk of the of a virus or a piece of malware on a server is low. Wow, it seems to me like the risk of your server being knocked offline by a bad update is uh, much higher. Which is why I'm asking: Is the risk of getting a virus worth the risk of getting your server knocked off? via a bad update? Well, that's a good question. There's also compensating controls you need to look at, you know, how well you're protecting the network itself to prevent worm propagation, that sort of thing. So if you had those things in place, then it is possible for you to run uh, most servers, I won't say all, without that. And a lot of people do. Um, the problem might arise if you have a PCI environment which specifically in PCI DSS there's a requirement that you run antivirus software on even your servers so you know minus that little compliance issue there it is probably possible to do that and again it's a trade-off of risk which are you more concerned about losing a server due to a bad update or having some sort of malware on it and, you know there's risks that you'd need to examine more fully to before you made that determination but Mike I would suggest that we are lucky if people can put antivirus on their server to begin with and and to hope that a smaller organization would actually have a, a test and development environment in which they could test these things before they roll them out is unlikely in smaller organizations depending on what business they're in so the fact that they have antivirus there and it's auto updating, I don't think that's a huge concern, but certainly they need to be able to recover a system if there was an issue such as this. Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, this isn't the first time that, um, you know, a vendor's rolled out a, an update that can impact your machines. And I think that's 
really at the heart of it. You know, if if we even step away from just antivirus, anti malware software, I think that's just a, a a known risk that when you allow auto updates to apply, um, there's always the danger that something in that update is going to break some functionality that you depend on, or in you know it can knock your server offline. It can do you know it can have unattended uh, side effects. And um, I, I I I totally agree, Keith. In a small organization, uh, you're right. You might be lucky to have anything running there. <laughs> um, it, it can be a very um, very different environment, but I still think, you know, for for your most critical machines, if you could just have some sort of delay, even you know, like four hour, eight hour delay, and when it applies the updates, uh, even if you allow auto updates to run, let them run in kind of a, a stair step fashion. So you know, uh, ten percent of your machine, or you know, twenty percent get the update initially, and then you you know throttle it back to so the next. 20% because if something's detected you can kind of stop it before it gets to your most critical machines uh, again that might be very difficult to, to implement in a production environment but um, that, that's really what I you know what I kind of see as the heart of it is um, you know you, you just don't know what's going to get into those updates um, necessarily and, and a lot of times the vendors don't know either you know sometimes they're trying to fix one thing and they break another. So um, I think that's just an inherent risk of allowing auto updates to run. When you, you let auto updates run, you sort of accept some of that risk. Um, but whether or not to let that run on a production server, that's that's really the question. Sure. Well, I guess we could move on to the next story. Um, and this is related to the uh, Associated Press Twitter account being hacked and then uh, dumping a single story about a White House bomb and the result of that was a, a momentary uh, drop in the market of about 1% which once everybody kind of realized this was you know bogus uh, it returned to about the same trading level um, it took very little time it only dropped about 1% and what's interesting is that um, Twitter, being the you know much like Wikipedia, the fount of all knowledge, uh, Twitter may be coming the fount of all current news. And I hope not, because they really botched that in the whole Boston Marathon bombing thing. Anyways, uh, what was interesting is the result of the markets from one tweet from the AP, which wasn't even a legitimate tweet. Uh, so what we have some information about, and there was some claim that the Syrian Electronic Army was the one that uh, uh, compromised the account, and I don't see any more information about that at this moment, but um, there may have been a password theft issue. It may have been um, a phishing attack. Um, there's a variety of information flowing around right now about what this could have been. But it's interesting that this, you know, this little bit of false information from, you know, honestly, a, a not very trustworthy source um, caused this market dip. And I've also heard the argument that that happened because of various algorithmic trading uh, systems who trade, you know, very rapidly based on, you know, market status, stock prices, you know, uh, uh, large institutional investors making changes in their portfolio and basically they're making trades as quickly as they can and making you know fractional amounts of money on each trade which over time add up to quite a bit and the reason is that they incorporated some of the news possibly from this AP Twitter account and started a sell-off which caused the stock price to drop or markets to drop a bit so I don't think we've seen any evidence of that yet, but that was uh, some information I'd heard earlier um, about that. So um, that's the story. Um, it's kind of weird, but it also shows kind of the interconnectedness of the world through Twitter, which is kind of scary. So I thought this was kind of important, so I thought we'd talk about it. Well, one thing I found interesting was uh, we were just talking, um, I think it was last week or the week before, about 
bitcoins and the ability if someone can control the market there's a a large opportunity for financial gain and I'm not implying that that was the the case here but um, you know, you have to wonder if, if someone can figure out an algorithm or figure out a way to make the market behave a certain way, um, if hackers could do that, there's an opportunity there for them to, you know, there's a financial incentive there for them to make this happen. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, um, like you said, Twitter is kind of being seen as official news, but uh, I think the stock market's one of those places where things are rapid and, and working, you know, very fast. And you're looking for any little edge, I think, in um, in what's going to happen. Um, you know, so I think people just kind of believed it right off the bat, and then you know, it only took what a couple minutes for it to be verified that it was false. <laughs> but um, by that point, it was too late, and it had dipped a percent. Yeah, it wasn't a significant drop. Brief plunge is the the term. But it recovered, so it's interesting. Well, it, it seems to me like the goal was just to say, ha, 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 look, we have access to your Twitter account, and look what we can do with it. That seems to be the goal. I don't think the goal was to make the stock market plunge at 1%, but that seems, the goal seems to just to be make a, make a splash, I guess. Yes, that's totally. That's what it was for. I, 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 the unintended consequence was this little drop in the markets, but uh, I think the connection between the two is interesting. The fact that somebody could post an article on a Twitter account and that mm, had sparked this this sell off. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Is if, if somebody can recognize that relationship, then they can. Maybe you know that if that was that was not the intended consequence of this action, but now people are probably looking at it closer, going, "Is there other things we could do to maybe manipulate the market? You know, have a more targeted attack, if you will, potentially in the future." Yes, and there are also the algorithmic traders who are you know they hire. PhDs in physics and math to figure these algorithms out. I'm sure they're probably going back and going, hmm, maybe we should adjust this algorithm to discount news a little bit. <laughs> well, we, we've seen things like this before involved with algorithmic trading where uh, there was a flaw in the algorithm or, or other instances where basically a, a minor a minor thing uh, can trigger a huge sell-off and and then the and then the uh, the they essentially close the market for a, temporarily or or stop trading of a specific stock for a, a limited amount of time reverse all of the trades because something happened to trigger a, a cascade effect that basically kills a stock or whatever and we've seen it before and 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 it seems like this is a direction that uh, they're moving to because of the speed of which uh, of trades everybody wants to be faster everybody wants to get their trades in first you know and, and all that and, and it's moving to a more automatic automated system and, and taking people out of the equation and 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 uh, and you know, algorithms just behave like they're designed, where people can say, "Okay, well, maybe this is a bad idea." Algorithms just say, "Well, this is this is what the algorithm says, so do it." So it, it's it's and 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 if people know what the algorithm is, or you know, catch wind on some of the things about it, they may be able to exploit it, as Mike said. Well, one other point I'd like to just bring up, I think it was mentioned in one of the articles, was how, you know, two-factor authentication could have uh, helped prevent the uh, takeover of the AP account. Uh, I wonder what you guys think if, um, you know, for these high-profile Twitter accounts, which I think could be recognized accounts such as AP, um, what if Twitter implemented something like two-factor? Do you think... Uh, do you think we're reaching the point where you know Twitter should have some pressure to do something like that? Do you think it could could work, or do you think there would be uh, a lot of resistance because two, two factors a little more inconvenient? 
I think there's a big push to adopt that right now, actually. I think earlier in the week, Microsoft announced that they now have two-factor authentication, and lo and behold, they used this, an RC standard to do it. Uh, it's the same hash-based or time-based one-time password system in defined in RFCs that Google Authenticator used. Um, they have their own app, but it's a standards-based one. So, yay, raw, look, Microsoft actually followed a standard and didn't invent their own. So while there is a push, I think it's more accepted now, and a lot more of these larger companies, if Google and Microsoft and, and Apple and Facebook are doing it, why shouldn't Twitter? And I think they are because they did have a job posting about six months ago that I think they were looking for an experienced engineer with knowledge of you know using and implementing one-time password systems so it's on the radar if not half implemented right now hopefully we'll see it soon well one other thing about uh, Twitter especially is um, this is the, this is a Twitter AP account how many people have access to the AP Twitter account and can mm. post on their behalf yeah, and that's a good question. I mean, with two-factor authentication, typically you're trying to make it so only one person, a one particular individual can authenticate. And with Twitter, you know, this account is shared among, you know, probably at least dozens of people that can post on the AP's behalf. Right, and, and, and I haven't checked. I don't follow the AP, and I have less desire to do so now perhaps but uh, I don't know if they use a team account or a system like Hootsuite where you can have one account but multiple people and it all goes through a web interface provided by another company too there are those team based systems for single accounts yeah well it, it's a very I think it's a very valid point and I think uh, Twitter would do well um, if they can implement something that would support that because it's not the only account where dozens of people uh, post but I I can't remember the story. It was a while back, but uh, something embarrassing I think got posted uh, to by uh, to some company's Twitter account by a, like a rogue employee that was upset, and it was hard for them to track down exactly who did it because you know dozens of people have access, and it would be nice if you could let people share that Twitter AP handle because that's important. But then you also have accountability, and you could track it back to the exact individual who made that posting. Um, that would be nice. I, I'm not saying it would be easy, but uh, that would be a really good security posture if they could provide that. Well, yeah, you lose out on the accountability aspect of it, certainly. And, you know, we see that even with people that, you know, from system administration points of view, everybody logs in remotely as root. Um, and they say, well, you know, it's okay because, you know, a lot of people, we have very few people that know the account password and, um, and it's restricted to a certain domain. I'm like, yeah, sure, that's fine, but what about accountability? How are you going to know who made what change? And then they're like, oh, yeah, I guess we don't have that. It's like, that's the problem. Same thing here with, you know, having a single account with multiple people. Yep, well, and, well, does anybody else have anything to add to that, or are we going to call the episode done? I think we've said our piece. Does Josh have anything to add via chat? Nope. nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you to uh, Keith Watson, Mike Hill, and Josh Gillum for saying nope. And uh, I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.